Uh, yeah, that won't do. Uh, how about this one? Um, no. I'll tell you what, I'll just start the podcast. Hello, welcome back to the Andrew Culture Positivity Podcast. I called it that because that's my name, the Andrew Culture bit, not the positivity bit, although that would be nice. I'm very pleased to have a guest with me today who's somebody local, but through the magic of COVID, we are recording this over Zoom. And actually, John, I'd like you to introduce yourself, if that's okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's John Ferguson. I'm a commercial editorial and product-based, or oh, project-based um, photographic artist. So that means I produce my private personal projects through my commercial and editorial work. Oh. Okay, cool. Let's do a little bit of history. Um, you've been a photographer for some time. It's a bit of a kind of a hackneyed question to say, what got you interested in photography? Because I think most people are interested in photography. But what, what first gave you the inspiration to, to make it your job, to make it your, your everything you do? Uh, it's a my history teacher. Just, he just, uh, we had a history lesson and uh, he, he uh, did contemporary American history and one of the people we were looking into was Muhammad Ali. And this picture came up on the screen of Muhammad Ali in a fight. And it was the most evocative picture I've ever seen in my life. It still gives me shingles now looking at, looking at the shivers, I should say. <laughs> I hope it doesn't give me shingles. Oh, no. No, it still gives me shivers now looking at the picture. And so, and once we learned about, not only about the picture, but also about the backstory behind it, it was all about storytelling. Mm. It's a picture that led to a story and a, and a wider narrative, and it involved the, the mafia, murder, and corruption, and everything else involved in this fight and this picture. So I just that's, that was what really drew, drew me to photography. Really, that one picture, of my history teacher, Mr. Mackay. Oh, well done, Mr. Mackay. Was, was that a school in Ipswich? No, it was in London. All oh, right. So, I thought you were from Ipswich, but you originally from originally from London. I am. I've lived in Ipswich for 11 years now. Oh, right. In fact, yeah, I think I first met you when you, you first moved to Ipswich, I think. Mm. I don't know where I got it lodged in my head that you were coming back to Ipswich for some reason, but we'll just kind of neither here nor there, really. Um, so kind of wanting to be a professional photographer and actually achieving that are two kind of very different things. And often the story in between those two points can be very interesting because it's still not a very in a very easy industry to to kind of break into unless you i guess kind of de right. declare yourself freelance kind of first off but what what was your journey can you, can you take us through the steps from that spark of enthusiasm to to mm. your first big assignment well first of all i was more than fortunate to find a job uh which uh, they were looking for a apprentice photographer, trainee photographer. And I saw the post in this window in this press agency in North London. Uh, I didn't know what a press agency was at the time, but I just went in and asked for the job and they, and I got the job on the spot. Oh really? You must have had a very good impression yeah. on them then. It was unbelievable. I didn't know what to do at all. So, um, so yes, yeah, so I, um, I took the job and so began my career in um, editorial photography that, 30 years ago now. That does sound incredibly simple. <laughs> I was expecting kind yeah. of a long journey of kind of trying to get your foot in the door, not not a kind of a... It was. It was five years at the agency and then five years learning a trade at the agency, learning how to take proper pictures for newspapers and magazines, learning how to composition, learning how to, to print, the darkroom, colour, the whole um, wet process of uh, photography in the old days and then once I had felt I'd learned enough at the agency I went on to look for work as a freelance photographer in Fleet Street which was you know half a mile down the road so we supplied images to the Fleet Street newspapers so I had relations with relationships with people on the picture desks in these newspapers so they knew me vaguely and so when I went down to look for work, they said, oh, yeah, you're from Sport and General News Agency or London News Service. You know, so it said, yes. I said, OK. So any jobs that came by me, you know, I scraped up and did the, you know, bottom run of the job, basically. Yeah. You know, that's how I got my foot at all. So, yeah, absolutely a, a traditional kind of apprenticeship. 
is is that something that still exists now do you think or is that a path i don't know i don't know how it happens now i haven't got a clue how it works now um i mean those jobs aren't there anymore um newspapers are are in decline um so i don't know how how it would work to get into newspapers now supply pictures on this on spec maybe you know go and do a uh an event somewhere and deliver the pictures to the newspapers yourself or sell them to yourself you know whatever sell them by yourself yeah, I, I know there are some agencies popping up because they've i've been in, they've contacted me for various reasons that that basically try and hunt down photographers or, or kind of work that's that's popped up on social media which I think it's interesting because it seems like a bit of a democratization, but I think it's a shame because it's, it's, it's the difference between something being a snap and something being a photograph. Mm. Um, do you have any strong opinions on that? Um, yeah. I mean, if well, it depends on what you're, what you're looking for really and how you're telling the story, doesn't it? If you're looking for to just to illustrate a, uh, an MP through Downing street or somewhere, if you ask comments, you just, you know, but uh, it depends on the story, how big of the story is, you know. Sometimes I've seen some amazing pictures from just really simple scenarios, like uh, an MP leaving number 10 or the House of Commons, and somehow the front of it has managed to capture an expression mm. uh, and the background and the and the weather and the clouds and the light, and somehow they've managed to incorporate everything that involves, in that, involves around that story. So, you, so it helps with the newspapers because they put words to the pictures that, relate to the story that they're covering so you have to have a sort of um editorial mind or a newspaper um a background of thinking mm. of how you can use this picture how you can take this picture to sum up, sum up the story this you know it could be a sports star mp rock star film star tv star no, it's very very goes back goes back very much so to the Muhammad Ali photo that, that is obviously it's a captured moment in time but with the composition and what's surrounding it and the, the detail of the picture uh, uh, the hint or of a larger story or just flat out the whole story can be told so uh, yeah. after spending some time as a, a freelancer on Fleet Street um, I mean I first became aware of your work for something quite different to to photojournalism per se and it was, I think it was when I first met you, it was fashion photography that you were, you were just coming off the back of, or you, you had spent some time doing. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Oh, gosh. I, I'm sorry, I don't remember that. I think it, <laughs> I did a bit of fashion photography. I've done it because, because in my, um, because as one thing about being an editorial photographer, you, you end up shooting a lot of different genres. Mm. And that's, that's one good thing about, you know, because people say you have to niche niche down you do with the food photography or architectural photography or or whatever whatever child photography or family photography whatever being an editorial photographer you have to be good at everything you have to be good at um, a, a good number of things so i was trained and taught in being good in this, working in a studio environment using loads of lights mm. so i was taught to do photojournalism i was taught to do fashion photography i was taught to do portraiture taught to do uh, um, conference photography or you know um, there's so many different aspects that I was that I'm good at so it, it was and it's difficult to pin down one or two things that um, you want to do for the rest of your career yeah. because when when you leave newspapers which I have done I had to jettison some of those ideas and just concentrate on one or two and I love fashion I love studio photography I love portrait photography I love editorial photography. so how, so how do you not do these things you have to keep on doing i for me personally i had to keep on doing them so at that time when i met you probably i was dipping my toe back into fashion again probably and doing some fashion shoots which i love doing well it sounds to me yeah. like you you spent a considerable amount of time i mean a, a really good a good and built a good foundation or kind of a good toolkit of, of skills and I imagine from from what you've said that working as a photojournalist it's not just mm. having the technical skills it's having the eye and the ability to perhaps sometimes make something out of nothing and other times to to in a very very short margin of time completely capture a story yeah. and and I can see why when you've developed that skill you know much of the same way as a writer or an author might mm never stop writing stories even if people you know <laughs> even if there's not a, a direct commercial reason to but you you can't stop 
telling those That's stories. Right. Now, I know you've kind yeah. of you've stayed busy um, as a photographer for a long time now and I kind of enjoy seeing seeing your work come up. I mostly see on LinkedIn, actually, which is you're, you're the only photographer I know who actually makes good use of LinkedIn for, for telling your own story, which is cool. I like it. Um, now, the reason I wanted to speak to you today was partly because you have a fascinating job and, and every time I've spoken to you in person, which admittedly isn't isn't lots of times, it's a few times, I've always found you very interesting. Um, but the last time I spoke to you, you almost quite casually mentioned something that I wasn't necessarily aware was a part of your life. And this is the social project aspect of your work. I think you, you casually mentioned something along the lines of using your commercial and editorial work to, to fund some of your social projects. So would you like to tell us kind of, is that just something you've always done or, or has it been a kind of a definite mission over the last few years? Yeah, well, you know, personal projects are, don't come cheap. You know, they, you know they, they, they take a lot of time and effort and logistics and sort of, you know, and ranging of stuff to do with my personal projects. Like when I left newspapers, my first projects, I used some of the money that I made, some of my redundancy money, papers to help me with my first project which was the cowboys in america and it was quite an extravagant project but when i left newspaper when i took redundancy i wanted to go and do my own thing i wanted to go and do my own projects okay so um that's why i left the papers to do work for myself and do my own projects and one of them was the cowboys in america so the so, cowboys in america is i've just just seen become aware of it just found it on your website actually and we're talking about kind of photos telling a story there's there's a a cowboy sitting on a cow now he's not sitting on it like a horse <laughs> that's that's what i kind of immediately get from get from that story but one of the things that i also notice about it which is something that i've not seen portray portrayed very often is that it's an african-american cowboy um mm. Was this kind of one of the aspects of, of that project that kind of drew you towards it? That was the whole reason for doing it. I, I thought it might be. <laughs> How many black cowboys have you seen? Well, that's the first, and 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 that's the truth. Um, it's quite difficult to do these podcasts sometimes. It's a bit like being a teacher. I'm trying to like coax coax things out of you. I was trying to kind of figure out which direction you kind of might want to take things. But well, I saw these. I was in in New York on an assignment many years ago, twenty odd years ago. I used to go back to America every, I mean, I used to go five or six times a year to America wow. on jobs and assignments. And, um, and one year I just bumped into these cowboys parading through um, Wall, St um, Wall Street, uh, Times Square. And I said, and I just looked at them and thought, what are you guys doing? You know, why are you dressed up as cowboys? I thought if, I literally thought it was some sort of cabaret act or circus act or something. It's interesting you use the word but, dressed up as. <laughs> Well, you know, dressed up as they were. What are you playing at? You're playing cowboys or something. Mm. And they said, "No, we're playing homage to the real cowboys, the first cowboys." So he said, "The first, and he said, and the guy said to me, "The first cowboys were black cowboys." I was like, "What?" So you know, so that threw me, a, you know, curveball that did. So I looked into it, but it didn't. It, it took me another fifteen, seventeen years before I could go go off and find these cowboys. Hence the title, "The Forgotten Cowboys." Because there's a massive community of black cowboys in America, mm. which nobody knew about. This is getting since my project. The more that they've they've become much more well known now, and the Guinness adverts as well, and then the yeah, urban cowboys and stuff like that. But but before I did my project, I got so much notoriety from the, from my project from um, covering these black communities in the southern states of America, where these massive community. Of cowboys come from and um, nobody's no one seems to have heard of them or knew they existed and you know there's their whole black rodeos with 15,000 people black people in there african-american people in there celebrating their cowboy heritage and lineage and i'm thinking to myself how comes no one knows about this it, well, exactly it, it seems it seems completely wild and, and i can see that you was talking about kind of ga gaining some um a bit of a reputation for this project and I can see that just found an article from CNN in 2012 and it kind of appears to be using your, your work as the foundation mm. for, for a, a kind of an exploration of, of why these, why these people aren't more widely known about. And that's a, that's a fascinating thing. Mm. Well, that's what I 
try to do. I try and find projects that we don't know as a we as a society or as a community don't know much about. Mm. So, like, do we know? Do you know much about people living with albinism? No, I don't. No, not at all. Do you know? Do you know what it's like to be? Do you like to be? Do you, know, do you know what it's like to live with the condition of being blind or partially sighted? I, I have worked with blind people. I'm, I'm involved in a project, so I'm not going to sideline this. I'm involved with a project at the moment, um, a musical project, which... I'm just saying that generally most, most people, people don't be. <laughs> and also, do you know, and also the other problems with people living uh, rural loneliness as well. People don't realise the, the extent of how serious this problem is so i try to highlight situations and projects like that and get them out into the general i can uh, certainly see that you you've provided a seed for for things that have gone on to be very positive or kind of you know just raising awareness is is a very positive thing in itself how, how do you become aware of these things you say with the, the cowboys that you literally saw they walked past you and you spoke mm. to them but how how have you come across some of some of the other projects like the rural isolation let's let's pick that one how how did you become aware of, of this as an issue because i live in suffolk <laughs> <laughs> and only only reason you drive around you know i, I drove i i work for various people in suffolk uh, suffolk wildlife trust you know go all around the county for that for them and i go to the most remote spots and you see people in the most remote places living in this remote spot i think could I live there? And then you realise that there's 70, 65 year old people, 85 year old people living on their own in these remote spots. You think, you know, how do they deal with it? And then you talk to them, they want, and they won't let you go once you start mm. talking to them. They want, they want, they crave um, um, communication. And you think, and then there's no, and you think about the bus service, they can't drive. So they're, they're almost marooned or isolated in these small communities rural communities so i did a project on and in isolation with farmers old folks and even with, with a young girl as well who was 17 and you know stuck in the middle of nowhere she couldn't couldn't leave she didn't have any transport didn't have any money worked in a local pub um she's dying to get out she suffered from mental um illnesses um due to the fact that she was in isolation a lot as well that didn't help and so this one thing leads to another. So I did another project on mental health as well. So, you know, they all lead to, all try and lead into other, other projects that I do. So, I can... so my, next project, my next project is on mental health. Okay. So I know the angle must be different or kind of the approach is different for each topic. But as you start a project, do you have a rough idea of what you hope the outcome might be? Or, or do you, is it more a case of exploring it as you go along? Yeah, it's exploring as I go along. I mean, I don't really do it for any fixed reason, actually, other than I just do it out of curiosity. That's, no, that, that's absolutely wonderful. <laughs> Not everything in life has to has to be so defined. Yeah, and I don't, you know, I don't really care who sees it, but I'll put it up on my website, try and give it as much air as I can, and, you know, it doesn't matter. But my next one I'm doing is quite a big one, the Mental Health Project, so I'm looking for funding for that. I'm working with a couple of people with local that you probably know as well, and uh, we're trying to get funding from the Arts Council and anybody else that will help us fund the project as well, because it's quite a strong project. Can you tell us um, any more about that? Were you kind of? Yeah, it's on. Um, it's called My Safe Place, and it's about <clears throat> individuals suffering from mental health health in issues and um, um, conditions, and how they find their safe place of sanctuary. Okay, so it's quite simple complex uh, um, context really so i don't say too much i've said too much already really but uh, <laughs> no, it, it sounds i mean i can recommend anyone listening just just go have a look at john ferguson photo i mean obviously the the, the commercial work the, the kind of the the paid work is 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 fascinating it's absolutely fascinating but this this aspect of the personal projects is is what's kind of really captured my imagination and I'm, i recommend anyone to, to kind of keep an eye on this and, and watch things as they develop What's been the most unexpected outcome of one of these projects? Has there been something that's really stopped you in your tracks and thought, I did not know that could happen from... Well, having the Prime Minister open your, my, one of my projects was quite, was quite a, a life uh, affirming the moment when he turned up and said, hello, John, I'm Gordon Brown. I've come to open your project, your exhibition. Oh, OK. It's good to me, news to me. Well, you didn't know he was, was coming. 
Only about an hour before, <laughs> two hours before, maybe two hours before the show. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, how, John, how could people support you? Can they support me? Mm. Well, um, well, they can support me with my latest project. My latest project is on mental health and individuals living with mental health. I'm looking for people with stories. Uh, their own individual stories or friends that they might know, friendly members that they might know. And I'm, I'm going to give the people who have their own safe place of sanctuary. So I photographed somebody last week who's, he was a construction engineer or owner and uh, he's safe place when he gets, when work gets too, too much for him, when he, everything gets too much for him and he needs to get away from everything or everything because he works on building sites, he can't escape really. So his way of escaping is by uh, using headphones. So he goes into his room and he sits there with his headphones and he plays music and, and that's his safe place, his place of sanctuary. Uh, I finally got another person who, who liked to be surrounded by water and she, uh, you know, she, I photographed her in the water um, it looks a really provocative picture, very nice. Uh, next one person was of somebody in his car. So it could be anywhere. It could be cooking, it could be reading, it could be anywhere. It's just a metaphor for bringing up more dialogue about the subject. It's a new way, more nuanced way, more creative way to talk about mental health in, in, uh, issues rather than the actual story themselves. Even though the stories themselves are important, it's a way to start dialogue and to maintain some dialogue and to draw more awareness towards these people's individual needs and, and uh, issues. John, it's interesting you mentioned the word individual because in my limited experience, um, it appears that the term mental health is used quite as an umbrella term to kind of mm. cover lots of other terms. And I think the danger of that happening is that it, it can start to lose, it can start to lose the hum humanity of yeah. mental illness uh, because just yeah. because somebody has a mental illness that that is not the definition of them as a person it is one aspect of their personality that's right yeah and it incorporates so many different issues as well with, with, with mental health um as you said it's like people use it as an umbrella term and it isn't you know, if there's so many um, aspects of mental health that's not been covered and one of the issues that i want to cover as well is black men and their mental health black men and their mental health issues as well. There's one corner of society that just doesn't get help at all. And, and only bad things can come from that. And um, that's probably one of the reasons why there's not enough or not insufficient amount of care and support for black men with mental health issues. Um, so that's one of the, uh, one of the, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Aspects that I'm going to get moving into in the next couple of months, uh, working with uh, societies or institutions or groups that might help black men with mental health in, in, uh, issues. So I'm looking for information surrounding black men with mental health issues uh, for, my, for this next project. Okay, I, I can see this. This is, to my mind, it's incredibly positive. Um, you know in my limited life experience even a negative theme you can find positives in i mean in my own life i was talking to somebody else a different podcast earlier today about the fact that things i've experienced and, and they have experienced that people just don't talk about so by shining a light on it with your project for one thing you're perhaps making it you're not just making people more aware i'd like to think that that might help open a dialogue with people who might not be prepared to otherwise talk about these things Mm, absolutely yeah that's the idea to open dialogue to give it a more nuanced and creative um uh, to show a more nuanced native angle into the subject into the issues so mm. I, I, it will, it'll work i know it works it's a strong concept and it will but it's a simple concept and it will work and the simple concepts are that they do work if it's too complicated then it gets a bit lost and diluted so yeah, it was to keep it simple. This, again, one one of the things that fascinates about about your work is the the captured moment that, in principle, is very simple and is a very simple thing to look at. Um, for example, the Black Britannia um, project, which is the one that said Gordon Brown came and opened. The, oh. the the striking photo of that is of 
um, the chap in the red. I'm oh, sorry, I don't know what it's called. He's wearing the the red. Is it called Stream Guards? Red uniform. Irish Guards, Irish yes. Guards, yeah. yeah. And on first principle, you look at it and you go, yes, yeah, it's, it's a guy in uniform. But the more you look at the picture, the more questions it starts to, to mm. kind of pose. Tunic's called, yeah, Red Tunic. Yeah, he was the first black guard to to guard the Queen, actually, in Buckingham Palace. Great. Mm. Um, okay, John, so people can support you by by looking, essentially, by being open and, and looking at your work, and they can do so at johnfergusonphoto.com. Um, yeah, they can get in contact with me. It'd be really good. And if they have anybody that could help support or get involved in my Safe Place projects, I'd be really interested to hear from them. That's fantastic. Thank you ever so much for your time, John. I really appreciate it. I'm going to include links to, to your work in the show notes for this episode. I am going to press the stop button for recording now. So I'm going to say goodbye. Would you like to say goodbye? Thank you for listening and uh, goodbye and good luck. Well, that's the end of this one. So what do you think? Do you like it? I hope so. This is the kind of bit that you might be able to tell I just use the same bit every time because, well, it's not so much lazy as efficient, but this is the bit where I say smash the like button or stab at it or actually just stroke it gently. Be nice. Yeah, why would you be so aggressive? But please like, please subscribe and please rank, rate, tell everyone this. These kind of things, I assume they matter. Everyone else says them. But there you go. So endeth this episode of the Andrew Culture podcast. If you want to know more about what I get up to, go have a look at andrewculture.com because I won't bore you with it here. Anyway, until the next time, keep it cool, stand in a dry place, um, or do what you want. I'm not your boss. Bye.